Welcome back. Um, so we're about to hear from Omri Salak, um, who's the uh, head of business operations at LogZ, um, which is an intelligent and scalable machine data analytics platform um, that empowers engineers to monitor, troubleshoot, and secure mission critical applications more effectively. So he works a lot with BI and data in general in this position, and he comes with a lot of experience at using data from similar web um, and before that as well. So Thank you. can you hear me in the back? Yeah. So thank you, Shira. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, BI strategy from a bird's eye view. Um, basically, I'm going to take two use cases, what we did at similar web and what I'm doing now with Logs.io, uh, in order to create what I think is the best strategy uh, for BI teams. Um, we'll go over a revenue model that we created. <coughs> Uh, and, and we're going to see how we can create a strategy from that. Um, okay. So, uh, like she said, I'm the head of business operations at Logs.io. <coughs> business operation is a fairly new concept. So just uh, to expa explain what it means for us at Logs.io, I'm sure it's different in other companies. Uh, but as head of business operation, I'm in charge of uh, business applications, sales operations, which is Salesforce, all the sales reporting forecast compensation plans, strategy, which is pricing, <coughs> five-year plans, all the competitor attack plans that we're doing. But, and this is what we're here to discuss today, it's also BI. And in the BI team, what we do is the revenue model, we set the goals, we set the KPIs for the team, uh, we monitor those KPIs, we do some advanced analytics and business analytics, and we track SaaS metrics. We are a SaaS company. A few notes before I start uh, presenting. So like I said, we are a B2B SaaS company, so most of my example will, will relate to that. You can do your own adjustments <coughs> uh, in order to adjust it to your uh, company. My approach is super proactive approach, meaning I don't wait for the stakeholder to come and ask me the question. I try to come up with the answers before they even come. Okay? Um, sometimes that won't fit to your company, to your BI team, to the structure of the team, to the culture of the organization. This is how I, this is my approach, and again, do your own adjustments. It depends on your, <coughs> on your company. <coughs> And one size doesn't fit so, of course, you can do it again. If your company is a big company, if you're an uh, e-commerce company, just do the adjustments. Questions, and that's a request that I have, just stop me at any time, okay? If you have anything to ask, don't wait to the end of the, of the talk, just stop me and ask <coughs> uh, Okay, we're ready to go. So what we're going to see is basically three steps uh, for creating the strategy. The first step, like I said, creating the revenue model and understanding the path to success. We know that we are now at, let's say, 10 million ARR or 18 million ARR, and we want to get to, let's say, 20 and by the end of the year, we want to double that, that, that revenue. So how are we going to get from where we are right now to that place where we want to be? That, <coughs> that will be the first case, and uh, the, the use case will be from Logs.io, where I'm working right now. The second step is gathering support and strategizing, meaning, okay, I have that path, I know how I'm going to get from here to there, what, or how I'm going to get support from the team in order to get there, that's basically, uh, I think, Shira, you asked uh, in the previous conversation on how to, to build the team, so I'm going to talk specifically about that. And uh, at the end, we'll talk about executing, how to, sh to track those KPIs, how to understand if we're on the right track or not. Questions? Okay, so in order to understand that path to, to success, in the beginning, we look at two things. We look at the current ARR, where we are at the moment. Everyone knows what ARR means? No, no. Okay, great. Manuel, BI? Business intelligence. Um, that's 
So ARR, yeah. annual recurring revenue, revenue for a SaaS company, that, that basically means the sum of all a, a subscription values. Okay, so if I have 10 subscriptions, each one of them worth $100, so I have $1,000 of subscription at the moment. Okay? So when you say monthly ARR, are you going to be No, when I say monthly, that's the where I'm going to be in every month in the next 12 months. I'm breaking that target. We'll get to that in a second. So I know my current era, let's say the beginning of the year, last December, December 18, ended with $10 million of error. That's, that's the revenue of the company at that moment. And the, the CEO, the board, the CFO comes and say, okay, I want to double that revenue. That's a common benchmark for SaaS company to double the revenue every year. <coughs> so I need to get in those 12 months about, about 10, 10 million in, in, <coughs> in total. Throughout, uh, throughout that year. Now, the next step is to calculate, okay, how much I need to grow every month, to your question. And let's see how we can do So the first step is basically I just grow what, uh, where I'm currently at. So this is, let's say, the previous four quarters, the previous, let's say, 2018. Okay, I know that I grew like this. Next, I will draw that line. I will put that X as the target I want to be. In eight quarters from now, in two years, I want to reach that goal. I want to double the revenue. I want to do triple the revenue in, in two years. <coughs> so I'm just getting the company's goal. That's just very basic. Most CEO will have that answer very easily. Yeah. But the next part, they usually don't have. They don't know how we're going to get there, how we're going to go. So we can have two approaches for that. We can have a very simple, linear quarterly growth, every quarter I'm going to grow by X, and that's going to, to get me to where I need to go. You can see in, in, the, in the number example here that it's a very simple. I start the year with uh, 18 million, I want to end in two years from now at 42, meaning I want to add 24. So I'm going to add every quarter $2 million. It's very simple, right? The second option is to do a linear growth rate, meaning to keep the same rate of 3.6%. It's just math, but eventually we calculate how much, how fast we need to go at the quarter. And I think it makes more sense in most cases to, to keep that same rate because you have more resources, you can keep, you can grow it at the same rate. Uh, however, and that's very important. Yes. So thank you. So the third, the third uh, item is seasonality factors. That's a good question. Sometimes, especially at, at SaaS companies, we have major seasonalities around Q4. Q4 is much better than other quarters. Q1 is a very low quarter for us. Uh, E-commerce, December, I assume, will be a great quarter, but July won't. <coughs> uh, so we have to make that, those adjustments and to put in the seasonality factors in. Okay, make sense? <coughs> so error is the annualized value of, the, of that subscription. If a subscription pays me, let's say, $100 every month, so the annual recurring revenue would be $1,200 per hundred. So the error refers to the value of the subscription, so the total revenue. Okay. So every quarter, that, that's the, the sum of the, of the subscription by the end of that quarter. It's a, it's a point in time. It's, no, it's not a quote. It's just a single point in time. Think about you're going to have 50 subscriptions, and each one of them will be $1,000 per year, $1,000 ARR per account. So the total will be $50,000 ARR. Okay? Any other questions? Uh, okay, so now we have this line that we drew, and we know how we're going to, where we're going to be in each quarter, but how we're going to get at every quarter. That's the, that's the, maybe the toughest question. And what I'm suggesting to do here is, so then basically the next step would be to calculate the monthly new business ARR uh, target. And we do that by basically making educated assumptions regarding churn. Can you go back to that? Maybe so what happened to other that you're asking how much you need to add for new customers? Yes. So you're disregarding current existing customers? So, uh, I'll check, okay. <coughs> so in SaaS companies, we have this concept of ARR cycle. 
companies usually what they do, they say, okay, I'm going to have in the beginning of the quarter, I'm going to have this $18 million of AR, that is a recurring revenue of, of, of $18 million. And I'm going to add, let's say, $2 million of new business, I'm going to lose a, a, to churn customers who left, okay? Like, think about subscription that, and um, subscription to Yes or Hot, so like to the cable company that just dropped. So I'm going to lose about $50,000 or $500,000 of customers, but the customers who stay in will probably expand, so I'm going to gain some of it. And I do the calculation in the, uh, of the ARR cycle, and eventually I get to the end ARR. But what we did at, at, at Logs.io is basically we changed the question to the rest. Instead of going the regular way, we went, we went to, we started with the end ARR, said, okay, I want to be a 20 million ARR. Now I already have 18 million. That's it, and that's your question. I know churn is going to be about 0 0.2, and expansion is going to be about 0 0.5, so all I need to get is 1.7 of new business in order to achieve my target. Okay, the churn, and the churn assumption and the expansion are just assumptions. We know, for, we know from previous months, we know from previous quarters, <coughs> We have industry benchmarks. Okay, that's how we get to that educated assumption. Make sense? Um, okay, so, so the output from here is basically just how much new business we need to bring. And to take it to the next level, and to set all the KPIs to all the company the business units, is basically start reverse engineering the fund. So again, with the same concept of changing the way that we ask questions, instead of asking, okay, well, I, if I have 1,000 leads per month, and those leads convert at 5% to opportunity, leads opportunities, and, and I have, let's say, 10, 10 sales reps, and each one of them can create, let's say, a million dollar a year. So I can create, let's say, 10 million dollar in a year. So we reversed those questions, we went back and we said, okay, I want to achieve that growth of $36 million in two years. And we said, okay, so how many reps do I need to get in order to achieve it? How many business do I need to close? How many opportunities do I need to close one? New, new accounts that I need to get. What's the average account value that I need to get? Um, and then we made, again, educated assumption according to history, according to the, uh, to the industry benchmark. The win rates in the industry is about 25%. So we knew that we need to get about four times the amount of opportunity that we, that we need to create, four times the amount of opportunity that we need to close. Okay? So you close each one of four? Yes, one of them. Usually, that, that's like the industry uh, uh, benchmark. We did analysis to see what it is for us. We saw it's approximately the same. It was a little lower, but we said, okay, hey, hey, sales team, this is your target, 25%. I have a question. Are you open to dialogue when you're coming with the numbers to the sales team? They're saying, listen, it's all good. We think you're very smart, but I think this percentage that you're suggesting that we need to get is too high. So yes, we are, we are doing that <laughs> with them. Uh, we're setting targets for them. If you remember in the previous conversation, uh, Eliza talked about how to set that KPI, who sets the KPI. In this case, I come with the KPI and then we start the discussion. That's why, uh, remember, this funnel is all reversed. So I started with the customer success team, the people who are at the bottom of the funnel, that's where we start. So once we agreed with them on the expansion rate, on the churn rate, we went back and we said, okay, we're fine with them, let's go to the sales VPs. And we agreed with them on the numbers. One last question: <coughs> Are you coming to prefer it? Like you're drawing the numbers because you have you know you can deliver a negotiate with the sales team. They are better negotiator than me. Um, but uh, we just can't do that. Okay? We just can't. Do that. Okay. You're telling them they have to go and find X number of new opportunities. How do you know they're going to find the same quality of opportunities that they had in the past? Because if they Obviously, we're exploring all the options they can. Yes. They're telling them, go find some more. But more, 
So that's actually uh, one of the issues that we that we had. We started changing the definitions. Once you change the definition of what is an opportunity, the quality change changes, and then the win rate is changed. So in order to make sure that the quality stays the same, we monitor the win rate exactly the same as we monitor the number. So the conversion rate and the number of opportunities we monitor together. Okay, I expect if the, the, the conversion will get go down, I expect the number to go up because I need more. We keep track of that on a monthly, weekly basis, everything. Maybe you should invest in upsell more and more. So we, we, the, the upsells and the churn are assumptions that uh, really could be made in the beginning, before we got that new business. Of course, sometimes they overachieve in, uh, in expansion, and they overachieve in churn, so we don't lose as many customers as we thought, and that covers for the new business that they missed. It's fine, but we still keep them on the targets. I can relate to what you said. It's very hard with quality basis. Yeah. Yes. Okay, let's go. Let's go a little bit up the fire. Yeah. Comes in the room. It's always going to get getting laughing. Um, okay. So, so additional metric that we can actually pull from this, uh, and it's also an example. It's not just uh, a KPIs for the business for the fund. It's also for HR. If I need to bring in that quarter 1.7 million new business and every rep gives me 340 per uh, quarter, so I need five reps, right? Or the equivalent of five reps. Sometimes it would be two half reps and four fully ramped reps. Okay, reps that are uh, that deliver full quarter. Um, so from every stage that we made up the funnel, we came up with more and more KPIs. Um, and as we went up and up, and that's, that's the number of bids required, so the conversion rate is also something that we're tracking on the same time. The, the, the quality of those of the leads is measured by the conversion rate. Everyone wants to close those leads. Everyone wants to convert them to opportunities and close them, uh, close one them, and get the money by, in the commission that they, that they If they're not in high quality, then we have problems. Um, Okay, so, so this is relates this relates to what we discussed about the, the 25% win rate, and if again if we got to the number of 1.7 new business we need to bring, and, uh, and the win rate is 25%, so yes, it's easy. I need to bring 6.8 million dollar of pipeline. I close that in 25%, and I get to the number, right? It's not that simple. <laughs> okay, and if someone knows this type of analysis, someone has seen it in the past. So what we saw that happen, what happens that usually opportunities don't close on the same month that you open them. So you can say, okay, if I need uh, to close 25 opportunities, I will just create 100 opportunities on the same month and I'm done. They have a velocity, it takes time. Sometimes it takes, if you look at enterprise selling, it can take a year on average to sell. Uh, so the, the easy way to do it is to say, okay, on average it takes uh, six months and then to do an offset and say, okay, you need to create the 100 opportunities six months before you need the 25 uh, uh, offset to be closed. But what we did is we decided to go in a different approach and we actually calculated the velocity of the opportunities. So let's take a simple assumption that we open 100 opportunities every month, okay? So the second column is the number of opportunities being created. Now, I'm doing a calculation here and saying, okay, on average, on the first month, on the same month that opportunity is being created, I close about 10% of them, okay? And on the second month, it's about 8% and then 7% and after that, well, uh, nothing is going to be closed. It's so once I do that, I can actually calculate back and see how many opportunities I need to create every month in order to achieve the goal of closing opportunities. Make sense? Yes? Yes. Um, okay, the, the method of, of applying, the, applying that to the model by calculating back, it's a little bit complex. I didn't show it here, but I assume that you understand that it is possible. Okay, so additional metric that, that we use, and, and we can do uh, even a lot more than that, 
But the finance department saw that we have all this data, that we, it's not focused, that we target for the entire sales team, for the entire organization, and say, okay, well, we can basically come up and say, what's the cost going to be? What's the cost structure? And that way we can repair, because I know how many uh, reps I'm going to hire, right? And I know uh, uh, how many SDRs. SDRs, uh, sales uh, development representative, they usually go hand in hand with, with the AEs, with the sales people. So if I keep a ratio of one to two SDRs to AEs, I know how many SDRs I'm going to have in six months from now, in nine months from now, I know when I need to hire them. So all of the costs, all of the, the cost of selling CAC, that's the customer acquisition costs, I know that in advance. I don't know it exactly, but I can forecast, I can estimate. Going from, from December of last year, I can look eight months in or even 16 months in and, and estimate what it's going to be. Um, so we've created that to, to the finance team. Um, like you see here, the number of sales reps needed and the uh, number of SDRs needed as well. Uh, so cut calculation, and I also know, because I told the marketing team, hey marketing team, I need you to give me 1,000 leads or 10,000 leads every quarter, they, they come back and they say, okay, I can't do that. I said, then why can't you do that? So they said, well, my budget for PPC is just a million dollars a month. I said, okay, what if I would give you $5 million or $3 million a month? Would you achieve that goal? Because that's what we need as a company. And they came and said, okay, well, if you give me $2.5 I can achieve that goal of, of 10,000 leads every month. So we, gave, we, we agreed to that, and then we had a very specific or very definitive answer to the question, what do we need in order to achieve that? <coughs> okay, questions here? <coughs> what is the size of these algorithms? Like, I'm assuming these are all different algorithms that are created, like, where does that come from? What do you mean by algorithms? Like, it's Excel calculations. Excel. I know, but I'm saying like, 2.5 million versus 1 million. Like, who, just, like, who makes that calculation? Oh, so, so the, the way that we worked with the VPs, with the CMO, with the VPs of sales, we basically came and say, hey, currently you have, let's say, five reps. Every rep can, can close a million dollars per year. I need from you 12 million dollars. Okay? They came and said, okay, well, seven million dollars is something that I don't, I don't have the capacity to give you. I don't have enough reps. Um, so we basically came up and said, how, how would you be able to give me that seven million dollars? What, what do you need in order to get Same way as we did with the CMO with the PPC. Okay, so it, it's basically, and to your question, it was an input from them. What do you need in order to achieve that? I'm not saying there's no budget for it. There's just, you cannot increase their budget to 2.5 million, but you don't have that. So then I need to roll my budget. If I have a problem of budget, then I will go to back to the CEO, back to the board, and say, hey, well, what do you, what do you want to achieve the 100% the vote, the 200% vote? It's unachievable with the, with the budget constraints that we can't have. Um, but there's a PC money, so we have enough. Let me just go away some more. Why don't you look at conversion and don't increase conversion rates, but increase budget for PPC? Maybe conversion is too low. Right, okay, so that's a, that's a good question. We actually, we actually did. Some of the cases we saw that the conversion rate was too low. It's hard to say when it's too low, because it, it's, it's hard to do benchmarks for, for uh, conversion rates. But there are some. So we, in some cases, we said, OK, we're going to increase the number of kids by times x, 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 and x. But in some cases, we're going to have to improve conversion rates. And yes, we created product. We didn't create them. We asked the product team to do a project to improve the trial experience in order to improve the conversion rate from the um, so that became like part of the target of the, <coughs> the team. So. And you mentioned my second question, how do you define when it is to come up with uh, Okay, so there are many ways to define what is an opportunity. The, the most common one that I know is funds. It's budget, authority, need, and timeline. Right? Yes. Yeah, so self -reported, self -reported, right? Yeah. Uh, so once you have that, once once the prospect has demonstrated those four factors, you have you know that you have a potential opportunity. And, and another way to look at that is to do the reverse. Is if the conversion rate from opportunity being created to opportunity close is just 
then you know that you open opportunities way too early. You need to wait. You need, you need the post to give you a little bit more before you open it. Yes? Okay, so at this stage of, of, uh, of this path to success, uh, we have an enormous amount of KPIs. Like, like Eliza said, we have this buzzword of KPIs, so many of them. Everything is just a huge mess. And we basically took all the assumptions that we did, all the targets that we created, all the criteria, <coughs> and we made them into KPIs. Okay, and that brings me to the next part of gathering support and strategizing. Uh, uh, and this use case is basically is more from a, a similar work my previous company. But this is what we've decided to do. We basically took all those KPIs, we divided them into top of funnel KPIs, mostly marketing, some SDRs, uh, uh, then middle of funnel, all the sales KPIs, how much sell, how much are we selling, what's the size of the opportunities, what's the win rate, what's the conversion rate from a lead to opportunity that's maybe in the middle. And the bottom of the funnel, which is everything that relates to customer success, product, okay, expansion rates, uh, churn rates, the actual churn in dollar, the actual churn in expansion. Uh, so we took that and we, and we s just set them up, like stack them up, and we said, okay, we took, I think, two people, put them on top of funnel, we said, okay, you're in charge of those KPIs. You're gonna monitor them, like that's the one thing that you're going to do, okay? Just monitor them all the time. Help the team improve. Each and every person here was sitting next to the stakeholder. We, became, we actually became business partners of the stakeholders. We were sitting with them next to the VP, next to the CMO, next to the CLO, and we're just helping them like a, like a trusted advisor. Um, that basically created a better relationship. The problem of the analyst, in my opinion, is that you are not always perceived as an advisor. Sometimes they think of you as someone who measures them. You know what I mean? Yeah? <laughs> um, because you measure them and then they, they can't really trust you. Because we were sitting right next to them, we were helping them, we were giving them advices, they started trusting us. As time, as time went by, they trusted us more and more. And uh, basically, it was, I think, one of the best decisions that we did as a team. What were these analyst KPIs? The analyst KPIs? So we had the uh, Tableau dashboards, we used Tableau mm -hmm. as a tool. So in Tableau, you can actually measure how many people could log in to your dashboard. So we wanted to make sure that we're not just doing all the analysis and all the tracking. So it was a, a basically a usage KPS for us. How many uh, people are looking in this dashboard? How many? And we said every, I think every quarter, we said that we want to double the, the amount of use of dashboards. Was anyone sensitized by the same KPI that the business unit was using? So we didn't align that. It's not, we didn't have like a commission plan for one of this. It wasn't fully aligned. Uh, but yes, if, if you were successful as an analyst, you, you became part of the team and a lot of the analysts, uh, I think someone, uh, someone asked that question in the previous presentation as well. <coughs> the analysts became part of the team. Actually, they actually moved to roles inside the product team. They moved to roles inside the marketing team. So that, that actually happened. Um, another function that we have here is the cross funnel, which is basically someone who is dealing with everything that's outside of the funnel and everything that requires like a, a cross funnel point of view, understanding helping the CFO, understanding the costs, because you can't really do cost calculation when you see only the middle of the funnel. So everything that relates to that, also HR. The, the entire revenue model that we described was basically sitting here. Because he was the only person who was able to see it. For the handovers, like as you can assume, there are handovers mostly between marketing and sales that people don't really agree on. It's hard to get marketing and sales to agree. So he was responsible with the two analysts that were in each one of them uh, uh, to make sure that everyone is aligned with the same KPI in the second. What is an opportunity for them? Questions?
Um, so we had those analysts sitting in different, uh, actually, places in the office, and we were afraid that the communication will be insufficient. So what we did is basically we created a routine of meetings all the time. We met all the time. Daily meetings, 15 minutes, like the first thing in the morning, we go, we sit together, we stand together actually, and we discuss. And, and, and we say, okay, well, we're in the middle of funnel, we're going to start the project, we're going to do this and that to improve the window. And the guy from Top of Funnel would say, oh, interesting, I want to be part of that, or it correlates with something that we did, or it contradicts something that we're going to do. And that actually created a lot of alignment inside the business, not just in the team. Okay? It made sure that nobody is doing things that contradict, like, uh, I think you, you think you got what I mean. Um, so that was a, a daily stand-up meeting, 15 minutes every day. We did a 30, 30, 60 minutes uh, weekly thing, where basically everyone came and said, okay, this is the project I'm working on right now, presented it. It'll be 15 minute presentation of what he's working on now. Interesting insights. Everyone wants, everybody wants interesting insights. So that's where we show it. <coughs> we show that. Uh, um, every month we used to issue this huge report that <coughs> eight pages, like to the management team. And instead of just everyone doing his own part and sending it out, we used to meet and basically discuss it. We went we were going through the entire funnel. Yes, we had this amount of visitors to the website, which converted the, um, to this amount of uh, 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 leads. Does that make sense? Did we went up? Did we went down? Did we have the conversion rate? Is it better than it used to be? Why not? We asked all those questions over there. Um, and I think we got a lot of interesting insights. Questions on how and to did do you have those meetings with your stakeholders or just with just the analysts? Just the report went out to the whole company? Or? So after we did this, this session on the report, we were like going through, adding comments, adding insights to it, like making sure that everyone is aligned. Then we used to send it out. The whole eight pages? The whole eight pages, yes. Is there a summary maybe? TLDR? There, there wasn't TLDR at the beginning, but uh, yes, eight pages. And uh, uh, they were printing it. They were taking it on flights, basically. It's like a review of the entire business for the month. For them, it was, it was great. They, they could go back and say, okay, last month, I remember I saw this. Now I'll go see what happened with that. I have a question. You said that your team is scattered around the office. Yes. Let's say, for example, somebody needs to work with sales. Are they actually sitting and asking them questions? They're sitting next to them, and sales usually come to them with questions. But they will also shadow uh, sales code, they will also shadow the discovery code. They will be part of the team. They will listen in. And, yes. So on a measure slack, um, are you aware of the measure slack? Measure slack? Yeah, it's like a bunch of analysts like, across the world to just talk. Okay. Um, <laughs> is it phone? Yeah, it's, it's slack, whatever. Um, so it's a question that I posed, um, like organizational design, like how do you structure, kind of what I asked before, um, do you structure as part of other teams or as, or as a central team? So this hybrid model, like most people said, this is what works best, like kind of both. My question is, if they're, if they're sitting scattered around the office, how did, let's say, do you, how did you solve questions of, let's say, infrastructure, like data infrastructure, um, issues of like, I mean, this as the central data strategy going on, like how did you sync everybody? So you'd be using, let's say, if there's issues or there's new pro like releases or things so like that. that. Everything we used to came up in those meetings. The, most of the things we saw in those meetings, yes, sometimes projects required a, a two different analysts from two different departments. A, so we created those hybrid teams just for specific projects. A, eventually, we did meet a lot. We, lunches we did together. We were a team, a, but a, like the day-to-day -day stuff we did. Like, like in, inside like the designated business part. Yeah. Um, so you know. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, executing. Um, I think most of it the uh, things that you already do, I assume. Um, but when we went, as we went through those, the, the, the revenue model and created it, 
we understood that not everything we can measure on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, some of the metrics are not even on a quarterly basis. And when you see, when you do a, a mid-market setting, nothing will happen in a month. A month is not an interesting time frame for, for itself. Uh, so that, for example, we, we, we measured on a quarterly basis. There was no point to putting that on the monthly performance. Uh, so we basically uh, went through each one of the KPIs and said, okay, this should be tracked on a weekly basis, this should be tracked on a quarterly basis, and we divided them, and we issue them on the reports accordingly. Um, the second thing, and, and in my opinion that's the most important part, is to understand the dependencies. Okay, if I didn't hit my, sell, my new business sales target, what, why? Like, what happened? And if I understand the dependency in a, in a good way, I can know that there are only two options, either I didn't close enough opportunities or the sizes of the average size of the opportunity was big enough. If the average size of the opportunity was big enough, yeah, let's talk to the sales team, we'll figure out why, fix it. If I didn't have enough opportunity being closed, I need to start going up the funnel and to understand why. Well, did I have a problem with conversion rate, with win rates, with, with the quality of the leads, quality of the opportunities, and so forth. So we basically understood the dependency of each part. Any questions about that? Basically, if you like, sales can say there's a problem with the quality and marketing will say, please are just and, fine. And they did. <laughs> <laughs> and they did. And eventually, uh, like I mentioned before, sales won't show people that that's my solution. I mean, you can have multiple approaches to that. Sales won't close the deals. They want as many deals as they can to be in the highest quality. The win rate is not good enough, yes, we need to improve something in sales, but we also need to improve the quality. So usually we do both ways. We try to improve both sides of that. I think that we found like a way that a lot sometimes spending a lot of money for things on paid advertising wasn't the solution. We thought it was and we put a lot of money and then we cut the money for half a year and nothing came. So so I think a lot of times it's not even just the money, it's just the right solution. Maybe you're looking at the wrong places. Marketing can be very complex a lot of times. I mean, I'm not in that team anymore, but I, I remember from seeing. So we, we try to give those, that decisions, <coughs> that level of decision, to give them inside the teams. It's not part of the revenue model. You can do whatever you want. You have the budget. And I, I, you're going to get money, I'm going to get this. And what you do inside, you can do with the top of panel analysts. Yeah, so the you have bad that guy can help you with that. But when we look at the model, we didn't go into <coughs> the, the top decision. That's why it's helpful to have analysts. Yes. We have some monitoring. Yeah, that's basically the reason we have this guy who's monitoring everything in the revenue model and the people inside who help them patch it. Um, okay, so another thing that we found out, which is seems obvious now, but as we did the revenue model, we found out that just every little insight that we had, or every little discovery that we had, every little analysis was very interesting to the stakeholders. So every analysis about, let's take the obvious thing, the average deal size. Once you do it by segment, and everything in the revenue model was segmented, it wasn't just one big revenue model, it was actually five of them. Because we had SMB, we had uh, mid-market, we had enterprise, we had Europe, we had US, so it was segmented. And, and everything that we did was interesting for them. So one of the good ways to get the buying is to share everything as you move forward. Okay, so show them, yes, I did this analysis. It's hard for them sometimes to understand cohort analysis, but they can, uh, if you simplify that. Uh, but yes, like share everything that you have, communicate everything that you, uh, that you did in the analysis for them to be, also it's interesting for them, and also it will get their buying. Um, and I think the best benefit of the revenue model eventually is that the entire company is aligned on the same target. We need to grow by 36 million. Everyone understand that, and everyone understand what they need to do in order to achieve that. Questions? Do you adjust the model like quarterly, or like whatever you started with? So we had two versions of the model. One, we adjusted every, every quarter. If we didn't hit the target, we more of them, but we still kept that original model to see where we, what we got right and what we got wrong. Another question. 
you have, it sounds like you have a very unique way to the way that you can see the office. It's like you have physical people, analysts in your team, and actually sit with the team. Which is, this is the first time I'm not talking here. This is an approach, something unique to you, something that was unique to Sierra Web. Did you have the uh, approval of the uh, C-level at Box.io to get those analysts in your team? So I, I think for them it was, it was the best solution for the, the entire uh, uh, C-level, C-suite. Um, the, the other option for them is to have an analyst, someone that will work on their data, which reports just to them with no experience, maybe experience, but no single uh, uh, unit that helps them solve issues, like with the data, what's going on in the data warehouse. Once everything was uh, uh, together, was under the same roof, basically with one BIT, there was no misalignment, everyone understood everything. But it, it was it the case before you came or after you came? Before that, as I joined, we started. And since then, I said more and more. Like everyone said on Slack, how, how do you call Slack? Mr. Slack. Mr. Slack. Slack, I think everyone said that it's the best way to. Everyone, a lot of people. A lot of people. Yeah. Good question, Brent. Oh, yeah. 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 <coughs> we were a pretty big team, in, 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 in the next time we were eight or seven, so some teams were more than one analyst. And it's not usually a competition, usually you have a senior one, some <coughs> experience with more time in the company and junior. And so between them they know how to decide who's, going, who's getting what and who's. I didn't see anything. Um, how do you combine, um, what I see a lot with BI teams is that they're a little bit siloed, I mean this doesn't sound siloed, but often they're just thinking about revenue and there's not a lot of um, integration between analytics on the one side and like let's say data science or things like that on the other side. Um, was there any integration you could talk about in your teams? I'm not sure what I'm saying, but sometimes they... Meaning, for, what's the goal? Like analytics, right? That's the yeah. most business oriented um, in terms of behavior that you can get, right? So I often find that BI has little comprehension and, and even smaller integration with the analytics side of things, which to me is like very much a pity because I work on the analytics side. It's a pity because the, that directly contributes to value and value contributes to sales. And you see what I'm saying? So like, was there any integration between the analytics and what was going on with the actual products? Yes. Um, and the BI, and on the other side, let's say prediction models and things like that from data science. Uh, so for us, everything was inside the BI. Okay, like the, the BI analyst was doing everything. He was doing the, the advanced analytics. He was doing, at some point, we actually hired a, a data scientist inside the team who was part of the course panel function. And he helped with everything that, wherever he was required. So he created a, Lead scoping mechanism, lead scoping algorithm, he had to change uh, prediction. So we had to put all those cases that we need. I think everyone did everything. Um, how do It's a pretty big move to do a revenue model like that, to be an analyst and come and say, okay, I think I have the answers to the question. It's not an easy move to do. Basically, you have VPs, you have senior people in the company that you come and you tell, oh, yeah, I, I feel VP, senior VP, this is what you need to do in the next uh, 12 months. It's not, it's not easy for them, so you have to build like a relationship with them in order to make them understand that it's for them. How do you see this continuing? Like if you've done it for I've to, done it, I think, yeah, four months so, so each two years you, you build so a every year one? We, or we do it again. We do it again for the next uh, 24 months. And you might change, adjust. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. We understand things. The company mature. Sometimes uh, in this similar way, we hire a CSO, uh, someone who of strategy and it changed everything that in the company, in the structure of the company. 
you have to adjust to the lot in order to keep up. It's a start of life in order to enjoy yourself. How long did it take to structure the whole strategy? Um, so a similar work with a pretty big team. It took two or three weeks. Everyone is doing their own analysis. They come up with their conversion rate, and then just combine everything together. Uh, at Logs IO, in the beginning, I did it alone. It took a little bit more than that. Uh, I, but I had to make more assumptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're working with a lot of data. I mean, the company doesn't have, or maybe you can collect the data, or is a new company so it, It's a good question. Most of the time, you have some data. You just take it, and you make assumptions on that. So if I have only the conversion rate for SMB, I would take that and I would load it a little bit and do the um, assumption for enterprise or mid market. Uh, if not, I will take industry benchmark. It's not forecast. Okay, the revenue model is not for forecasting, it's for target setting. So if there's an industry benchmark that opportunity should be closed, let's take the CAC. You know, the CAC, the, the, CAC the, time to recover CAC. Time to recover CAC usually uh, should be 12 months. Uh, so you make sure that that's what's going to be in the revenue model. And you say, okay, this is your part to make sure that the CAC won't be higher than 12 months to recover. Okay, guys. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I especially um, think, I, I know people came here from Haifa and from Jerusalem, and uh, it's is also a Jewish fast day, and the fast just ended out right now, and there were people here who were fasting and came from Jerusalem and places like that, so I appreciate that. Um, also, thank you to Omid, um, the original, the organizer of this group. He videoed the whole thing. The video is going to go out hopefully soon, pretty soon, and the slides, it'll be posted on the group. Um, he also has two other super interesting demystified data groups. One is called AWS um, Big Data Demystified. The other one is called Big Data Demystified, right? Um, so please join those groups. I've been to them. Those meetups, they're super interesting. Um, also, um, I've been, so I, I, I'm involved in social media and stuff for, for data and business, which is a specific um, niche within the data world. Um, and I see that there's really not a lot of focus, uh, enough focus on the business aspect. There's a lot of focus on the technical aspect, not enough on the business. So I, I've been collecting resources and people and things for months already um, and, plan on and plan on starting a Facebook group for a discussion about this topic, which will have on the one hand resources that I've collected, Net Slack and LinkedIn and, and other groups that are just helpful to think about the bigger problems and not just how do you implement analytics, how do you deal with this, which is important, don't get me wrong, but it's only part of the question, you know? Um, so it'll be, I'll post all the information on, um, on the meetup group. Um, please join and share with your, share with your friends um, in space. Um, and um, yeah, thank you all for coming and uh, all the stuff here will be posted on the meetup group. Um, and thank you to Google for hosting tonight.